Okay, so hey guys, uh, welcome. Tonight we are going to be talking about the truth about financial aid. I'm Mike Mochizuki. I am a senior consultant at Admissionado. And I guess first off, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. So, I graduated from Brown in 2010. I work as a video producer for Fortune 500 companies. I've been helping students get into great schools since 2010. And a little uh, fun fact about me, I love fresh baked pie probably more than anyone should admit. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, let's get started. So first off, let's talk about today's goals. First thing is, what are we doing here? So the goal today is really twofold. Uh, the first thing is we want to try and understand the process better. Uh, a lot, I think personally, a lot of the stress from financial aid is it's, it gets a bit confusing. So the goal here is just to relax. The second thing is let's determine your personal options for financial aid. What personally do you have um, available, options you have available to you? What are kind of the good options you can make? What are risky options? Um, really, we're just going to try and figure out kind of what works for you. So again, the goal today here is we're going to, one, understand the process better so you can relax. And two, let's determine your personal options. There are some things that we will not answer today. So we are not going to be answering questions about the Common App. Again, today's focus is financial aid. Uh, two, finding the right college. Again, you know, we uh, there are a bunch of other um, options on finding the right college, but today's uh, today's slideshow is really on just financial aid. Going to college abroad again does not fall into the category of studying abroad. College savings plan. Now, college savings plan do fall under the financial responsibility of paying for college, but a lot, most of these plans required planning years in advance, and we're assuming that the people in attendance today, um, so you're, uh, the parents listening right now, that these, you guys have already kind of set that um, in place, and what we're really looking at are current juniors, seniors, maybe the occasional sophomore, but families that are really um, looking for how do you cover the rest of the information, cover the rest of the financial responsibility. So things that we will go over today. Again, the point right now is we're just going to try and break this down um, a little b-boy style and go over just general information that we'll be covering in this hour-long presentation today. Uh, FAFSA. So FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. Don't worry, we'll go into it. Uh, so if you're, if you already have felt your heartbeat starting up a little too quickly right now, don't worry, we'll get into it. Uh, the CSS slash financial aid profile, this is another form. It's used by over 600 schools and scholarship programs. Again, relax, don't worry. We're going to get into that a little bit later, but right now you can just chill out. Um, federal aid, so money that's coming from the federal government. State aid, so money that's coming from the state. Private scholarships, and private loans, and alternative funding. Now, right now, in case you guys have any questions, feel free to write them in the little box that is showing up on your screen. Uh, I'll save about 10 minutes at the end of this presentation to answer those questions. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to write them in there. Um, you know, the last webinar I did here, I had a bunch of great questions. So keep the, throw those in and I will do my best to get to all of them. Great. So let's uh, start talking about financial aid. But first, let's just zoom out. Let's look in the macro right now and talk about why are we here today? Why are we having this conversation? It's because college is expensive. There is actually very, it's very hard to argue that point. College is extremely expensive. What is the cost of college right now? So with over 4,400 colleges in the US, tuition alone can be as much as $50,000 per year. And the cost of college is not just tuition, it's also variable costs. Um, so if you're studying a specific major, uh, especially science, lots of times there will be additional costs that have to do with lab equipment. Um, if you're studying something like design or um, 
design or architecture, then there may be computer things that you need, um, so specific types of software. So again, even though there's tuition, that oftentimes doesn't count in all of the costs that can also uh, be incurred and that schools can actually add on afterwards for your specific major. In addition, for the cost of college, there's housing. So are you living you know, on campus in a dorm? Are you living off campus but renting an apartment? That adds up a ton. Meals, books and supplies, transportation. If your school isn't a walk from your house, are you driving there? Are you getting a bus there? Are you flying there? Are you flying home for uh, Thanksgiving, for Christmas? So these are costs that are incurred during college that a lot of times people don't think about at the start of. And of course there are personal expenses. So do you want to be able to go out once or twice a week and have a slice of pizza? Are you taking into account the fact that maybe you need to buy more socks? Um, so there are personal expenses too that can certainly pop up along the way. Again, all of this just makes the cost of college a bit higher. Harvard, for instance, cost uh, $57,950 for the 2012-2013 year. So that took into account their tuition, their housing, um, and their meals, and their books and supplies. It didn't take into account transportation or personal expenses, but about 60 grand is how much one year of college cost. Um, if you guys are interested in finding out more about what is kind of the walkout sticker price of college, what you want to do is go check out the U.S. Department of Education. They have a great site called the College Navigator, and that'll let you really kind of figure out uh, without any skewed calculations on the college's page how much college actually is going to cost you. So, now that I've scared you guys a bit about how much you're going to be paying for college, isn't it always better to go to a college that's within your budget? Well, I'm going to say not so much. So let's talk about the cost of a bad college. It's just four years, right? That's what we think is. It's just four years. You're going to be living until you're 100. So what is it that you're only four years? You've got 96 others you there. Unfortunately, the reality is you get what you pay for. So the more you pay right now, the more that this is going to help you out later down the road. And your college really stays with you forever. So what you want to do here is, honestly, you want to go to the best school you can get in. And I know parents right there, you're probably feeling that little twinge of fear that that $60,000 tuition is going to be coming down upon you. But a college degree has tremendous effects. It, has, it affects your future income. It affects your job promotion. It affects networking opportunities. The people that you're able to meet in college are usually integral to the jobs that you're able to have later on, other possible opportunities, um, graduate school acceptance. And unfortunately, the reality is, before we go too much farther, is that the name on your college can make such a tremendous effect on your future. And, you know, it, it's unfortunately, it's not fair, it's not great, but it's the harsh reality of college. So what you really want to do is try to go to the best school that you get into. So if we've kind of come to terms with that and accepted that if college is going to, the college is going to be expensive, but we also know worth it, what is financial aid? Just the general, what is it? Well, financial aid in general, thank you general bonkers, is money awarded or loaned to students to assist in paying for college. So most colleges, this is 81% of private schools and 93% of public practice need blind admissions. So you may have heard this term thrown around, need blind admissions. And what need blind admissions means is that they do not consider a student's financial need during admissions. So if you come from a heavy need family or whether you do come from a fairly um, financially stable family, it's not going to affect whether you are accepted to the school. Um, having said that, do keep in mind that that means that there are 9% of private schools and or sorry, 19% of private schools and 7% of public schools 
which don't explicitly practice knee blind admissions. Um, however, the, again, the vast, vast majority do. Now, it is important to also be aware that even some of these need blind schools become need aware. So they are aware of how much need uh, financial situation of the students applying to the school when they're looking at these three specific categories of students, waitlisted, international, and transfer students. And so what that really means is that if you're right there on the edge and you're an international student or you're a transfer student or you're a waitlisted student and your your academic scores and your extracurriculars just aren't quite strong enough for the admissions committee to definitively say yes you belong here that's where they may look into uh, into your financial situation and it will affect your admissions now furthermore we, let's also talk that need blind does not mean wealth wealth blind and what this means is that colleges can still prefer wealthy candidates and be considered need blind so to give you guys an example if somebody's coming in and they are incredibly wealthy they a college can still give preferential treatment to that student for admissions and remain need blind because they're not choosing against anyone because of need but they can choose for some people because of wealth I know that sounds a little gray um, and the reality is that it is uh, but that is just kind of what the situation is right now with admissions committees so it's something to be aware of now again um, Wealth blind really only apply this. I want you guys to take that last part about wealth blind and really only keep it in mind if your family can easily afford college. Um, if if your family has any sort of need whatsoever, I want you to to disregard that statement. That really only applies if your family can easily, right now, write a check for four years of college. Because it does you no good to be accepted into a college if you can't afford it. If you need financial aid, apply for it. Don't try to play a game. Of taking out a huge personal loan, which and we'll get to that later, um, that's going to cause a pretty severe financial hindrance. Just because you think it might give you a little edge when it comes to applying to school, what you really that only uh, again, need wealth the need blind and wealth blind, but, or sorry, excuse me, the wealth blind really only applies if you are in a very strong financial situation. Otherwise, anybody who may possibly need financial aid apply for it um, and you can rest assured that because of need, thanks to need blind admissions you will not be penalized in your admissions for your financial background okay so let's talk about where to start when it comes to financial aid and I know uh, when it comes to this these first steps can really seem like giant leaps so take a breath and we're going to talk about where to start now, to qualify for 95%, the vast, vast, vast majority of financial aid opportunities, you have to fill out two forms. First is FAFSA. This is a government form, also referenced by many private scholarships. Um, and it's really required in order for people to, both organizations and the federal government, to have a sense of what your financial need is. The second form is the CSS Financial Aid Profile. And this is a form created by the College Board, which is an organization um, that tries to help students with their applications. They're also the company in charge of the ACT. Um, but it's a form created by the College Board for schools and for private scholarships. Again, we're going to get into these two forms in detail. So just know that these are the two forms you're looking for. Again, the only reason you should not fill out these forms is if you are literally not planning to apply for any financial aid. And if you're not planning to apply for any financial aid, you, you may have come to the wrong webinar. But uh, we're still delighted to have you here. So let's talk about FAFSA and answer the old question, what the hell is FAFSA? So first off, as I said before, FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid, which means when you apply for it, there's no charge, there's no cost. Um, it's by the government and it's required in order to qualify. So the FAFSA qualifies you for all government financial assistance. And that includes the federal government, it includes the state government. Um, and in addition, it's also required by many private scholarships. 
So many private scholarships will want to see some of the information, will want you to have submitted a FAFSA form so that they have a accurate understanding of your financial situation. You cannot predict your package. Um, the FAFSA form will basically tell you how much money you are owed and you can't predict this even if you come from a wealthy family because your package is determined by multiple factors including the cost of college uh, currently as well as the number of children who are currently in college. So if you come from a family where you have two older brothers who are going to college right now, uh, your likeliness of getting a package is actually significantly higher because the government understands that your parents are paying for multiple students in college at once. To fill this form, go to fafsa.ed.gov to fill out the form. And I know because now you're, everyone's thinking right now, I know, calm down, don't worry, about when do you fill this out? You want to submit this at the very start of January of your senior year. Before then, you can't do it. They, they literally will not allow you to fill out that form. Um, but what you can do is try and get some of your information together, um, tax return statements, things like that. But go to fafsa.ed.gov. You can find out more information there. And just keep in mind, what you really want to do is submit this form at the start of January. The form becomes available January 1st of your senior year. What will happen is once you submit your information, it will take about two to four weeks. And after that, you and schools you've listed will receive what's uh, called your EFC, or it's your estimated family contribution. Your EFC is how much your family is expected to pay each year. So this is the amount of money that the government believes you are responsible for paying for each year that you are in college. As a result, that, that quantity, the EFC, will be used by schools and private scholarships to determine uh, the amount of aid that you can receive. Now let's talk about the second form, the CSS profile. I know, it's a nice form. So, I hope you guys actually enjoy that, any of you guys who are so you think you can dance fans, which my sisters are. Um, after you submitted the FAFSA, some schools are going to require the CSS slash financial aid profile. So let's talk about that form. This is a form, which as I said, was created by the College Board, and it is used by over 600 schools and scholarship programs. And this is primarily for non-government aid. And by primarily, I mean completely used for non-government aid. The government will use FAFSA, private institutions, many of them at least, will use the CSS slash financial aid profile. This does have a registration fee and a fee for each school that you send it to. So uh, look into which schools you're specifically targeting and you can figure out whether you need to even bother with the CSS slash financial aid profile. The deadlines for the profile, the CSS profile, are college specific. So again, really when it comes to this form, you're going to want to check with your college's financial aid departments and now is really the time to do it immediately to find out what their specific deadlines are. Some of them are later in the year, some of them are early. So check in with those schools now to try and figure out what their personal internal deadlines are. And this form you can complete at collegeboard.org. Again, this is going to provide another source of financial aid. So congrats, we've sent in the forms. How much money do you get? I know, that's the question everyone wants to know. Um, so let's try and find out. How is your aid calculated? And I hope I didn't date myself with that photo. So there's actually a fairly simple formula used to calculate your aid. And that is, they'll take the cost of that college, they'll take the cost of, the, of an individual college to which you're applying, uh, they'll subtract the estimated family contribution, which is that number you got from the FAFSA, which the government came up with, and that will give you your demonstrated need. Each school will individually try to meet your demonstrated need with its own package. And what this means is that the financial aid office itself is going to um, offer you this award package. Now, if you're asking yourself, when are you going to get this, you will find out what a school's award package is when they send you your acceptance letter. So you're only going to get financial aid if you've actually been accepted to a college. This is one big reason why uh, you shouldn't take into consideration what your 
whether you can afford a school or not when you're applying. You want to apply now to the schools that you want, and then you can find out what your actual later on. Uh, these packages, which the financial aid office is going to give you, are going to include a combination of federal, state, and college age aid. So it is the financial aid officer at that college, at each individual college, who determines what type of assistance you get. So how much federal aid, how much state aid, and how much college aid. What these colleges will do is they're going to start with grants because they realize grants are free money. We'll get into that in case you don't know what a grant is. They'll then apply work study, which is an opportunity to work to make more money that helps pay off the college. Again, we'll get into that too. And then they'll look into loans, which are borrowed money that you do have to pay back. And again, they're going to try to cover your demonstrated need. Uh, there is no promise exactly that a college will be able to meet all of your demonstrated need, but they will try their best. So um, having discussed this, let's talk about what type of aid exactly you might receive. So what we're getting into now is really determining the types of financial aid that are available to you. Remember, like I said before, the way that this works is it's really determined by your package is going to be determined by the financial aid office at each individual school. But just so that you guys can kind of build a familiarity with what are your options, uh, we're going to talk now about the different types of financial aid awards and loans and all of that good stuff that are coming to you. So first, let's talk about the federal government. What can your government do for you? JFK wouldn't be crazy about this slide, but we'll move ahead. So, the first thing the federal government can do in terms of financial aid is give you a grant. And as I said before, grants are free money. So they're money that they give you and you don't have to worry about paying back. Uh, the most common here are Pell Grants. Pell Grants will give up to 5,645, that's uh, I believe this year's current number, per year for low-income families, so families that have a need. In addition, there is also the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, the FCEOG. And this is an additional grant for, of $4,000 for especially low-income families. So a lot of people get Pell Grants. They're by far the most common. The FCEOG grants are a bit more, are really held for people who are coming from significant need. There's also a TEACH grant. Now the TEACH grant is an additional $4,000 per year if you plan to teach after graduation. And so there are a couple of requirements for this, uh, on a, a specific amount of time, uh, location, but this is an option for students who are looking to go into teaching or willing to teach after graduation. In addition, there's also the Iraq and Afghanistan service grants. And the Iraq and Afghanistan service grants are for students who did not get a Pell Grant, and it will replace it. And this is for students um, if a parent died in service. So again, like I said, it's a substitute for the Pell Grant. If you did receive a Pell Grant, uh, then you will, it, you will most likely not receive the Iraq and Afghanistan service grant. So these are grants. These are the mo four most common sources of federal free money that you can be getting. Pell Grants, FCEOGs, TEACH Grants, and Iraq and Afghanistan Service Grants. But there's more. I know. You guys are excited, but we get lots of federal support. So what else can your government do for you? So the second source of money is loans. And loans, as we said before, are borrowed money. Most common here are Stafford loans. The first type are direct subsidized loans. And this is up to $8,500 a year. And the way that this works is that when you take a loan out, uh, because you're borrowing money, there's interest that's applied to it. So the amount that you ultimately pay back is going to be more than you took out. And the way that the subsidized loans, the subsidized Stafford loans work, is that while you're in school, the government will pay off your interest. So you won't have to pay any additional fees. You're just going to have to pay off what you borrowed. Um, this is only available to students with financial need. 
after you graduate, then the interest, you will be responsible for paying off your own interest. The second source is direct unsubsidized loans. And this actually has a higher amount that you can take out. So this is up to $12,500 per year. And because it is unsubsidized, this means that the interest accrues while you're in school and the government will not be paying that off for you. This is available to all students regardless of financial need. The second type of loan available it, from the federal government is a Perkins loan. And this is up to an additional $5,500 a year for high schools for high need students. Again, for students with high need, it's an additional $5,500 per year. And finally, there's also the, uh, the option of PLUS loans. And this will actually, this is uncapped, it is used to basically cover the rest of your tuition that you're not able to be paid. However, the difference is whereas Stafford loans and Perkins loans are taken out by the student, PLUS loans are taken out by the parents. After grants and loans, our next option is work study. And work study is earned money. So you're going to work hard and you'll get some money out of it. And work study is additional money that you can receive in exchange for part time employment. And again, remember, this is all of these, um, all of these federal financial aid options, the grants, the loans, this work study is all determined by the financial, the finance, a financial aid officer at your college. And what your financial aid officer will do is they will try to find a part-time employment that you can do that will be related to your field of study. So for instance, I had a friend who was studying uh, event management. So she actually ended up working in the, at her college's event planning side. So every time they brought a speaker onto campus, she would help uh, put that together. And so again, what these financial aid officers will do is they will try to find you a work study that lets you make money, but lets you also build yourself and further your career and your education. And so what they're really trying to do is help you with, make sure that your work study does make you money and does help pay off college, but is still a value to you. Okay. Now, with Uncle Sam out of the way, let's talk about state financial aid. So you've got these guys behind you. Now the state is mainly going to be helping you with grants. Uh, all of the loans are, take, are done by the federal government. And these grants come in a wide slew of different types. So there are need-based grants, there are merit-based grants. So if you're a really great student or a great athlete, um, the grant then a lot of colleges may have a specific grant for that. There are grants for ethnic minorities. There are grants for degrees in high need fields, so specific um, things to study which the state is trying to promote. Um, can off they'll often give a grant to encourage that. There are also grants for veterans, so maybe you're currently in service, maybe you have already finished your service, but the states will all often provide grants there too. The state also has some grants for uh, people with disabilities, and also for students who are coming out of foster care. Now, state financial aid mainly applies to students who are applying to colleges within their state of residence. So, for instance, if you are a Michigan resident and you're applying to U of M um, or Western, that's then likely the state of Michigan will look, uh, will have a couple of state financial aid grants that you can look into. It's not promised, but certainly this mainly applies to students who are going to college within their state of residence. Some of these grants are going to be awarded by the college when you've submitted your FAFSA. So for instance, if you're an Illinois resident and you apply to U of I, then the U of I financial aid office may award you a state grant. However, others are going to require independent application. So you're going to have to try and track down these scholarships on your own. What you want to do here is contact your local state agency. So go on Google, look at your state's uh, um, college grants, and you can probably find this. Each state, unfortunately, has its own site. Otherwise, I would have given you guys a link here. So you're really just going to have to Google this and try and find your personal state's financial aid support. And here, you really do want to be aware of state deadlines. 
these financial aid grants don't do you any good if the deadline has already passed. So make a little note to yourself right now, as soon as this webinar is over, look into this, the current state grant aids, just make sure you haven't missed any big ones, or small ones for that matter, and we'll get to that a little bit later on. There's also college financial aid. So let's make a deal. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because colleges are trying to get you here. Once they've admitted you, they want you to attend, and so they're going to try and make as appealing of a financial aid offer as, poly as possible. So they're going to try and throw in any other grants and scholarships that they have available. Again, it's only grants and scholarships from these colleges, um, but they're going to be looking to try and give you something. Very few schools do not offer any type of financial aid. But again, that doesn't mean that you're certain to get anything. But these schools do, once they've admitted you, they do want you to come. Most of the Ivy Leagues will offer a completely free education if your income is below $65,000 a year. Again, this is one reason why you should, if, if anybody's listening comes from severe and significant financial um, need, do not count out even the top schools because these schools want you. They, they admire the fact that you've come from a place of need and are, are performing on the same level as students from a lot of privilege, and they want you in their schools. Certain schools are going to meet 100% of demonstrated need. So remember how before we talked about how uh, these colleges would look about how the government, the FAFSA form, would tell you what your demonstrated need was? Well, a bunch of colleges are going to make sure that you reach that. So between other opportunities, they're going to make sure that you can definitely get that need. Great. And what you want to do here is contact a specific school's financial aid office. Um, they will have certain merit-based scholarships, athletic scholarships, departmental scholarships, depending on what you're looking to study. So for instance, if you're looking to go to college to study the classics, uh, lots of times they may have a specific scholarship just for students studying that because it's a, it's a somewhat understudied department. And here what you really want to do is you want to apply early because colleges distribute from a limited amount of funds. So the sooner you apply for financial aid, which again, like I said, apply you know as soon as you can for that FAFSA and make sure that you check in for those CSS profiles. Uh, you want to apply early, apply earlier because these colleges are pulling from small limited funds, which means that the sooner you apply, the larger packages you're likely to get. And if you apply later on, they may have unfortunately already given away a lot of their money and they just won't be able to give you as much money as they would otherwise like. And okay, so we've gotten the government out of the way. We've gotten college out of the way. Let's talk about private organizations. Don't rich people give away their money? Doesn't it, it seem like people, there are always these multimillionaires who are dying and giving, leaving all their money for scholarships. So why can't you get a little bit of that? Now the thing is, with private organizations, there's supposedly millions of dollars in scholarships that go unclaimed every year. The truth is, that may or may not be true. Uh, it's a bit of a contested fact. Now, part of this is true. There are a lot of scholarships that go unclaimed every year, and that's partially because some of these scholarships have somewhat unusual requirements. For instance, there are some scholarships out there that have a height requirement, so you have to be at least uh, so tall. Some of them require that you have a hunting license. There's one, uh, one special scholarship out there that will only give you a scholarship if your last name is Leavenworth. There's one which requires you to go to prom wearing a duct tape, an outfit made out of duct tape. And actually your date has to also be wearing duct tape, so uh, guys, good luck convincing your dates to wear a duct tape, a duct tape outfit to her prom. Uh, there's another private organization that gives a scholarship depending on the quality of your duck calling skill. So again, there are some odd scholarships, which is why some go unclaimed. However, there are large corporate scholarships. Coca-Cola, Walmart, Best Buy, and Toyota are four really well-known ones, and these are pretty significant scholarships that you guys should probably look into as soon as possible, just to make sure that you stay competitive. If you're looking for scholarship opportunities, visit the U.S. Department of Labor. They have a great site for scholarships, 
um, and that'll list a bunch of different scholarships that you want to check now. These sources can come from, uh, in terms of finding other sources for possible scholarships, definitely check in with your high school counselor. Uh, a lot of them know per a lot of private organizations and they can't keep uh, their own personal archives of private organizations in your area that you definitely want to look into. The College Board also has a list of scholarship opportunities and SallyMay.com is also really useful. What the takeaway here right now is you want to start looking now. Some of these private organizations uh, have very early deadlines. A lot of them are March 1st of your senior year, but some of them really apply for juniors and sophomores. I personally, I didn't look into, uh, into scholarships, private scholarships until my senior year, and I found it actually pretty disappointing how many of those scholarships were specifically focused on juniors. And a couple, some of them were even sophomores. So if there are any parents out there with kids who are in their junior year of high school or their sophomore year of high school, have them start looking now for scholarships. Um, there is a lot of money out there. And because most people don't look that early, a lot of that money does not go claimed. Let's also talk about private loans. So private loans are going to be loans that don't come from the government. So the, government, the loans that we talked about before are specifically federal loans, the Stafford, the Perkins. These are other loans. And the reason that we're talking about this right now, honestly, guys, is that not all colleges can meet your demonstrated need. They'll try their best to, but they aren't assured to. So what if the financial aid package that a school offers you doesn't cover everything? And... Unlike the mask, I hope you guys don't turn to theft and robbery, but you will still have to turn to a bank to get some of your money. Now, you should only be considering private loans from banks if you've maxed out all of your federal loans. You wanna definitely go with federal loans first because these private loans are going to have higher interest rates than the government loans. And what this, this can mean the difference in thousands of dollars. This especially is true when it comes to the um, it comes to the specific type of Stafford loans in which the government will subsidize part of it and they'll pay off your interest while you're in school. Uh, the The reality is banks are not going to be doing that for you. So again, try to avoid private loans if it's at all possible. You also really want, if you do go down this road, you want to be careful. Make sure you understand the terms. Make sure you understand the grace period when you have to pay things back. So again, I, I cannot emphasize it strongly enough, guys. Try to cover your the cost of this missing chunk with other measures before you turn to a private loan. Um, it can just be, it can it can be a bad route. Uh, one thing you do want to look into if you're going down this road is look check in with the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. I put a link right here, consumerfinance.gov. Uh, they have a, a link right there for paying for college, but check in with them. They have a lot of inform really useful information on their site about private loans that you can go with and private loans that you should probably avoid. And let's talk about alternative ways. So guys, the thing is there are other ways to pay for college. Um, if you're not working on the next Facebook and also haven't already become a billionaire, uh, there are other ways that you can pay for college. One of them is the ROTC. Uh, the ROTC is basically a on-campus um, early sign-up that you can do with the Army, the Navy, or the Air Force, in which they will pay for your entire college and give you a stipend. So this is basically a full ride that you can get to college, and you basically just need to sign up. What you'll do is you'll complete basic training while you're at school, and you'll actually do regular drills throughout the year um, during the week. But there is a catch. For each year of payment, the government is going to require one year of service afterwards. So they will consider your the training and the drills that you do during the year one year of service, and then they'll require one additional year after you graduate uh, for each year that they're paying. The Peace Corps and AmeriCorps, in case you have so I know some people out there have a very strong um, aversion towards armed forces. Um, if, the, if this is a bit more up your line, go with 
Peace Corps in America will also provide educational rewards uh, in exchange for their service. However, it should be noted these are significantly smaller than what the ROTC offers. They're often about $5,000 in an educational grant. So ROTC here, the Army, Navy, and Air Force will give you a free ride, and that may be something that you guys want to consider. But, and I recognize this, everyone comes from a different situation. So let's talk about you. Let's find your personal situation. Okay, for the Richie Rich, and I don't mean to use that term at all uh, disparagingly, but if any of our listeners right now have wealthy parents who support you, they love you, they can't wait to try and pay for you, but should you still be applying for financial aid knowing that it's unlikely you'll get some? Now, the reality is that your funding options are fairly limited. Uh, one thing that you want to do, though, is you still want to fill out the FAFSA and the CSS financial aid profile if that applies to the colleges that you're looking at. Um, and while it's very unlikely that you'll receive any federal grants based on this will make you eligible for state and college grants. And these include the merit and athletic grants um, that you be eligible for. This is also, and this is the key part here, is it will make you qualified for private scholarships. So again, uh, to find more, out more about those private scholarships, contact your high school counselor, the U.S. Department of Labor, and the College Board. But most of these private scholarships, excuse me, will require that you fill out the FAFSA and possibly the CSS slash financial aid profile. Um, this will not affect your chances it will not affect your chances of getting into school just because you're asking for financial aid. That will definitely not deter the uh, admissions committee at all. And like I, may, I alluded to before, some admissions committees will be actually more interested in, in Richie because he's wealthy. And this can help a borderline candidate, so it's something to be aware of. Let's talk about the Arthur. Now, Arthur also comes from very wealthy parents. But his wealthy parents have cut him off, and they believe that it builds character for him to pay for college himself. So what is Arthur expected to do as just an 18-year-old without any real job? The unfortunate truth for Arthur is that his student aid package is still being calculated based on his parents' income. And just because his parents say that they're not paying doesn't actually help him. The U.S. government believes that, the, that college is primarily you and your family's responsibility. And so just because your parents say we're not willing to pay college, uh, the government still expects them to be able to. Now I know that this can be put some people in a really tight spot. Uh, and it, it's unfor an unfortunate reality that this does happen to some students. Um, but your parents' income will only be a non-factor if you are an independent student. What is an independent student? So. To be an independent student, you must either be at least 24 years old, married, have children or dependents, have been orphaned since 13, on active duty or a veteran in, in the military, uh, to be homeless, or a graduate student. And between the two of us, I think a lot of graduate students would say they're basically homeless. The last option is you can also be an emancipated minor. To be an emancipated minor, the court must legally recognize that you are independent of your parents. And this isn't easy to do. Usually courts will require that parents have ceased all support and contact for at least a year prior. So to become an emancipated minor is a pretty serious, uh, is a pretty serious thing to, to undergo. So the reality is that Arthur, if he's really looking to pay for college, is limited to either Richie Rich's options and having a real serious conversation with his parents about why it's important that they help him fund his college education, or he should be looking to the ROTC for funding. But let's talk about the Goonies. In which, and I just mean average middle class kids who are wondering, can they afford the Ivies without finding treasure? So what the Goonies want to do is they, they want to fill out the FAFSA and the CSS profile, which again is going to make them eligible for federal, state, college, and private organizational financial aid. Again, with federal, they'll be eligible for grants, uh, some loans, and work study. With states, they'll be eligible for grants, again, for those independent grants that the college itself doesn't allocate them for. They're going to want to contact a local state agency 
and just see if there are any scholarships there to which they may be eligible. And uh, the Goonies will also be eligible for some financial aid from their college. And this, again, may be financial aid-based, it may be merit-based, it may be athletic or departmental-based, um, but they will be eligible for some scholarships from those areas. And again, the Goonies should be looking into private organizations, so they should contact their high school counselor, look at the U.S. Department of Labor, the College Board. Uh, a couple others here are SallyMay.com, USA Group, FastWeb.com. So there are a bunch of private organizations with scholarships. And again, they want to start looking their junior and possibly even their sophomore year for these scholarships. Again, the Goonies can also look into the ROTC, and that's another strong alternative if they're looking for uh, that ride. Let's talk about Charlie, though. Now, Charlie doesn't think he can afford college at all, let alone a whole chocolate factory. So where is his golden ticket? Charlie's want, going to want to do the same thing as the Goonies. So fill out the FAFSA and the CSS financial aid profile and submit those forms. And like the Goonies, this is going to make him eligible for federal, state, college, and private financial aid. However, unlike the Goonies, because Charlie is coming from some pretty significant need, Charlie will likely receive larger awards and financial aid packages. And again, at some Ivy, some Ivy League colleges, um, he's probably eligible for actually a free ride. Charlie is significantly more likely to receive need-based grants and scholarships, especially if his academics are just as strong as the Goonies or Richie Rich. And again, and guys, I cannot emphasize this strongly enough, apply early just because these financial aid funds are coming from limited, uh, limited buckets, so you really want to try and get in as soon as you can. Let's talk about another situation. And this is one where we have the intelligent daughter of an illegal immigrant. So I'm going to actually break this down into two different stories. The first story is Christina. And Christina is herself a U.S. citizen, but her parents are undocumented. What she wants to do is she still wants to do the same thing as Charlie. So send in her FAFSA, uh, send in that CSS profile. However, the one difference is that for the FAFSA, she should write 0000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 basically zero out her parents' social security number. And this is kind of where the finance, the government has kind of met in between to allow a U.S. citizen like Christina an opportunity for federal education while acknowledging that her parents are undocumented um, workers. Everything else for Christina is going to be exactly the same as Charlie. The other situation here is Floor. Now Floor, like her parents, is an, undocum is an undocumented um, person here in the US. So the first thing that Floor should know is that she still can legally attend private and public colleges. There is no law that says that she is not allowed to attend school. However, she will, like, she will definitely be ineligible for federal funds, which as we've seen before is a fairly significant chunk of change. And she may be, uh, she may be eligible, um, but possibly ineligible, depending on the state, for in-state tuition if it's a public college and aid from that college and private scholarship. Uh, what she really wants to do is Flora is going to want to contact these individual schools to learn about their policies. Uh, some schools are far more giving than others, so she should check in with those schools. All right, guys. So I hope, you, I hope you guys are still with me. I know we've, we've covered a ton today. So let's review uh, what we've learned today. I hope you guys have some fun. But just to kind of touch base and cover the main points. Uh, so what you guys want to do leaving this webinar is make sure you complete the FAFSA and the CSS slash financial aid profile, certainly by early January. But it's good to look now. Uh, the financial aid officer at each individual college will be the one to offer you an aid package when you're accepted. And so that's really when the decisions are made. Until then, work hard, put together a great application, apply to amazing schools, um, and we'll talk. And then once you actually get this package, that's when you can kind of compare what are your options. The package that these financial aid officers are going to give you are going to consist of federal aid, so grants, which are given money, loans, which are borrowed money, and work-study, which is earned money, state aid, which is usually for in-state students, but it will just be grants, 
College Aid, which is also grants. And outside of that, that's where you can start looking for alternative sources of financial support. And these include private and other state scholarships. And these are the scholarships you guys really, really want to look, start looking for now. Um, again, there is the option of private loans. And again, guys, I can't emphasize this strongly enough, but you want to avoid it if it's at all possible. Um, let's try and stick with federal aids and alternative sources of scholarships. And speaking of alternative funding, remember, if it seems right for you, the ROTC scholarship is really an amazing scholarship, um, and that's one way to pay for your college education. Um, and just to give you guys a quick little heads up, uh, so this was all put on thanks to Admissionado. Uh, we're here for all your, your questions, and we work really hard to make you, sure you guys have superior, compelling applications and that you guys can have just as stress-free and enjoyable of an application process as I hope you guys had with this webinar. Uh, a little info about us, we've worked on over 15,000 applications in the past six years alone. Our creative staff of consultants and editors have, been, have come out of schools like Harvard, Yale, and Stanford, and of course Brown. Um, we've already created successful applications for the schools that you guys want to get into. And many of us have personally worked with Ivy League admissions committees, so we, we know what's going on kind of on the insides. 95% of our clients have gained admission to at least one of their top choice schools. All right, now uh, we have a little bit of time, uh, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions. By the way, guys, thanks for sending in so many great questions. Um, let's see, what, question one, does a scholarship or financial aid help cover the non-school expenses? The books, the food, the plane tickets home. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, do I get to use the money however I want, or is it allocated for specific things and given directly to the school? All right, so guys, this is a great question. Um, this actually really comes down to, uh, to that formula that we talked about at the very beginning, how they calculate need. And their cost of college takes into account things like transportation. It takes into account things like uh, your meals, your expenses, um, your books, and usually even, a, and depending on it, um, sometimes a, a personal living stipend. Sometimes it doesn't include that stipend, and that's something to be aware of, but sometimes those, the way that they count, uh, calculate the cost of college, it does. So when, when colleges are trying to meet your student need, that fee is considered a part of that, oftentimes. Now, again, what you're going to want to do is touch base with your specific college financial aid officer, see how they're calculating it, see what they're looking into, and that will probably give you the best sense of what their specific scholarship and financial aid package is really offering for you. Now, I will actually throw this out there um, before somebody asks. Um, it is possible that uh, you you really put your nose to the grindstone, do an amazing job, and you actually get more scholarship than your need. Um, and so you've actually completely paid off everything. It's an amazing, that would be an amazing situation to be in, and you have this kind of excess of scholarship. The reality is you have to report all of these other forms of scholarship, and so you will probably have to give some of that money back, especially probably to the government. Um, so that they can help other students who are also trying to afford their education. So that is one thing to be aware of, but adds, is, that's definitely a great problem to have. Uh, question two that I hear is, so if I want to apply to Harvard, for example, but no, I can't afford it, um, I won't know how much money I will get from Harvard until I hear if I got in. Is that the case? And at that point, is it too late for me to apply for other grants, et cetera, if the school doesn't cover as much as our family needs. Okay, so this is a great question. Um, so basically, the situation here right now, guys, is we have somebody who's looking to go to Harvard, but it's certainly beyond their income level. Um, and they're worried that they aren't going to find out how much money they'll get, um, and that they could be in a situation where they get accepted, they get a package, but it's still not enough. What do you do? So. Uh, the reality is this is when you really need to just try and bone up hard um, and apply to as many scholarships as you can now. The more scholarships that you apply to now, uh, the safer that you'll be and 
if a school like Harvard is looking for you, you've probably got some really great credentials um, and some, some great test scores, some great extracurriculars, which means you're probably a really strong candidate for scholarships. Again, in case any of you out there are worried, you don't have to be the valedictorian three-sport athlete to win a scholarship. There are plenty of people who aren't three-sport uh, athlete valedictorians who get scholarships and a lot of money from that too. But it helps, especially it sounds like you might be, uh, this person might be it if they're really consider, considering Harvard. So what you want to do is make sure you uh, pay, make sure you apply early, uh, apply for as many scholarships as you can in, at, you can, and then once you've found out what Harvard's offering, once you've found out what you've gotten outside of Harvard, and you put that together, that's really going to be the time when it's time to sit down and evaluate. And that may be the time to consider uh, those private loans because, uh, like we said, college will stay with you forever. And these are four very important years. And making sure you get into the right college and the best college you can possibly get into, this is the time to find out. If you guys have any other questions, oh, actually, we see I, we've got one more question. Uh, no, we're good. Okay, if you guys have any other questions that pop up, I'm sorry, guys, we, we don't have time to get to more, um, but I want to make sure I can get you guys out of here within the hour. As always, feel free to contact me at mike at admissionado.com. Uh, if you send an email to info at admissionado.com, some, one of the incredibly trained uh, mentors here on our team is more than happy to touch base with you. Um, so again, yeah, feel free to reach out to us, and we're more than happy to try and help you however we can. Um, and let's just, you know, kind of wrap up, you know, as you guys go on and continue through your process, what you guys want to try and do is remember to learn as much as you can about the financial aid process. Um, talk to people who've already successfully gone through that. There are a bunch of people who have applied for financial aid and college itself and have already successfully done it. Um, and they're more than happy to talk with you and see how they can help. Make sure you ask as many questions as you can. Any possible concern or worry that might pass through your mind, make sure that you uh, ask those questions. And now's as good as time as any. So if you didn't, if we weren't able to get to your question and you're still wondering about it, uh, throw that down in an email, shoot it off to us, and we'll try to get to it as soon as possible so that you can sleep just a little bit easier. Um, and again, if you guys want, uh, let's chat. I know sometimes email is not the best form for you guys, so feel free to give us a call. Uh, what we actually have is a free consultation. So it's a, basically a free half-hour assessment of your entire application strategy. You can talk to me or one of the awesome elite mentors we have here and it's just a really relaxed phone call where you can talk about your application, your letters of recommendation, your essays, the schools you're applying to, and we're more than happy to talk it all out with you guys. Again, any other questions you guys have, concerns, email us, info at admissionauto.com, and I'm Mike at admissionauto.com. And guys, thank you so, so much for taking the time. I hope this was fun for you. I hope it was useful for you. Um, and stay in touch because we have a bunch of really cool events coming to us, coming up soon, and, you know, we, we, our goal here is really just to be useful, and so check in with us. We have a bunch of really fun things coming. So thanks, guys, and hope you have a great rest of your day.